So, uh, okay, so, so what's happening, and uh, of course, uh, that's part of the thing we're going to, to look at, is uh, how light moves in a Schwarzschild geometry. So if you have this uh, black hole sitting there and light is uh, deflected, some orbits of light, uh, maybe I should uh, momentarily stop this. Uh, some, so you have this black hole uh, sitting here and light is deflected and you have some light rays which reach you directly, some other ones which reach you after making one turn, some other ones go twice and so forth. And now uh, I think, I'm not 100% sure how this video was done, but I believe that if you were heading straight ahead exactly to the center of this black hole, there would be no rotation. I mean, you would see, uh, you will see these uh, arcs, which are called Ar Einstein arcs, and which we're going to try to talk a little more about uh, later in the course. Um, then these Einstein arcs will still be changing, but they will not be rotating. But here we're not going straight to the center, but we'll a little off. So which means that we're rotating a little with respect to the black hole, and therefore these images uh, acquire this. We have the impression of the image rotating, but if, in fact it's, uh, it's because our angle of uh, uh, view on the black hole is changing uh, dynamically. That's why this thing rotates. So let me show you uh, just once more, or for the latecomers, uh, the video of um, a journey into Schwarzschild. I can work these things for hours, so. Good, and um, we continue with the study of the Schwarzschild metric, right? So, chapter four. I thought it would be fun if I uh, came completely in black with black gloves and then you would only see something appearing on the blackboard. But I think it's not dark enough here for this to be fun. So maybe I try it once, but <laughs> anyway, Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, so the Schwarzschild metric. So uh, for one, uh, the metric and the, something called the Birkhoff theorem. There's a K missing here. Good. So, uh, well, let me just write the metric to start with. So, the metric will be uh, minus 1 minus 2m over r dt square plus the same function that is here now appears in uh, the denominator. And um, this is a coordinate r, the same as here, plus r square d omega square. Uh, d omega square all my life and throughout this lecture will be uh, the unit metric on the sphere. So this is d theta square plus sine square theta d phi square. Um, so theta and phi are the, your favorite angles on a sphere. Uh, well, since we're in the basement of a mathematics building, we have to say that r is non-zero, because otherwise this is not defined. Uh, 
We also have to say that R is not equal to M because uh, this piece here will have a problem, right? If R is equal to M, this is 1 minus 1, 0, dividing by 0, no way. So, uh, so that's the restriction at this stage. And this surface uh, R equal to M will end up being the event horizon, but it's certainly not apparent from this form of the metric. Uh, what else can we say here? Well, for example, we could uh, formulate a theorem due to Mr. Uh, Jepsen uh, in 21, but somehow nobody seems to know about this theorem uh, by Jepsen, so it's attributed to Birkhoff and this appeared in 23, and which says that uh, every spherically symmetric Um, every spherically symmetric metric uh, uh, metric which solves the vacuum Einstein equations the Ricci tensor equals zero so these are vacuum Einstein equation this is spherically symmetric uh, can be written in the form 1 can be locally written as in 1 well except uh, Uh, around uh, r equal to m, right? Around okay, so this is the theorem here. Uh, the way I formulated this is uh, a bit funny because uh, before you've written the metric in this form, you don't know what it means to be at r equal to m. So, this is a little weird, and I'm not going to try to make a, a formal statement which would justify this. Uh, but, uh, and if you uh, open 99.9% .9 of books in general relativity, uh, nobody will even mention this except around r equal to m, so they will just tell you that you can write the metric like that. They will not tell you that this is locally, uh, but of course uh, this doesn't make sense at r equal to m, right? And um, it doesn't make sense at, um, well, and globally is also wrong. So, so that's the correct statement. <laughs> and what is the point here? Well, first it's a uniqueness theorem for spherical symmetry. Uh, in vacuum. Uh, R mu nu equals zero means that you have a metric which satisfies vacuum Einstein equations. Uh, but so uh, this theorem implies uh, two things. First, uh, so if you forget about these uh, restrictions here, uh, it says that spherical symmetry implies uh, implies uh, one stationarity and here there's an obvious sense in which this is true the metric components are time independent okay so you don't have to worry what this means geometrically or uh, or uh, in, a, in a nice way we'll discuss this later but at this stage well we just say well obviously this metric is time independent uh, it also implies another thing that the uh, time reversal symmetry. So it's a time reversal symmetry. And uh, well, of course, what the implication is modular restrictions, right? So, so one has to interpret this with a little 
grain of salt, but roughly speaking, that's what it says. Symmetry, namely that uh, if you change t goes to minus t, then this metric doesn't change, right? Because dt goes to minus dt, so dt square goes to dt square, and the metric doesn't change either. So not only you can move in time, nothing happens, but you can also flip time and uh, nothing happens. Now these two things are called staticity. So one plus two are called called staticity. Now what's the point about this time reversal symmetry? Suppose that I've been sitting here for since since our last lecture and rotating this at constant speed. So you would say, well, uh, it is kind of static, nothing really happens. Uh, well, of course, you can see the different writings here, if you could see them, so it's not completely static, but uh, if you were uh, <laughs> looking at that for a long time, and also, actually, you could co-rotate with this, right? So if you were rotating with this object, then nothing would be changing. But now if I, uh, uh, so, so this is kind of stationary, but now if I change the, uh, the direction of time, so I've been doing this all the time, and you say, well, t goes to minus t, then this is going to start rotating in a different direction, okay? So uh, this is the main point of uh, being uh, stationary and static. You can have a situation where nothing changes because something, if there were no colors on this object uh, and I was rotating it, it would be just a stationary time independent situation. But if I change the direction of time, this thing starts rotating in the other direction. Okay, So that's the difference between static and stationary. So, uh, so this is our uh, Birkhoff theorem. Uh, and uh, uh, also let me say that uh, if m equals zero, uh, we, on, we get our uh, favorite uh, Minkowski metric, so because then this becomes minus one. Uh, you're dividing by one here. And this is the Minkowski metric, which we know and love and call eta. And this is Minkowski metric in spherical coordinates. Right, it's just not in standard coordinates, but in, in spherical coordinates. Good. So this is... Uh, Something to remember that the Schwarzschild metric, well, is a beautiful, interesting black hole solution of Einstein equation, but actually it has a strong uniqueness property. Uh, as, as soon as you assume that you are spherically symmetric and vacuum, you can write the metric like that, at least locally. Well, I shouldn't have erased my metric. Uh, not very clever, but uh, well, I write it when I need it again, or maybe I write it on the top. So let me write it here again, g is equal minus z. Uh, I never know whether I should write a square here or not. Uh, let me write it like that. Uh, the problem is that there might be a, a, a clash of notation with the lectures if I uh, don't put a square here. Well, not immediately, okay? So let me just uh, write it like that and remember that sometimes I will put a square here and uh, 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 
that it is not a good idea, but yeah. Okay, let's, let's try to work like that. And V is 1 minus 2M over R. Good. So the question is now what happens uh, uh, at uh, R equals 0. Uh, because obviously, again, uh, r equals 0, v, well, minus infinity or not defined, but say if you think of v equal minus infinity, then this uh, radial term will still be okay because you're dividing by inf infinity, so you say, well, it's 0, or by continuity, it's 0, but you still have a problem here, right? And uh, indeed, we have a problem uh, which is called uh, singularity. And uh, one way uh, to justify that this is a problem, that you calculate something called the Kretschmann scalar. So you sit down, calculate the Riemann tensor for this metric, and calculate this particular uh, object, which is uh, equal to 48, if I remember it correctly, n squared over r cube, uh, r6. Uh, this is called Kretschmann scalar. And uh, obviously, this is a problem because if this, uh, uh, if you go with r to zero, then this goes to infinity, right? So. So why is this a problem? Uh, well, first of all, uh, remember that uh, the uh, Riemann tensor is something like uh, the derivative of the Christoffels plus Christ squares of Christoffels. And the Christoffels are something like uh, the inverse metric times the derivative of the metric. So, uh, and of course, if I do this contraction here, there'll be uh, inverse matrix involved, right? So, uh, now, the Riemann tensor is a tensor. A tensor depends upon coordinates. So, uh, if you look at the Minkowski metric uh, in spherical coordinate, you think, well, this is something deeply wrong at r equals 0 because uh, the determinant of the metric goes to 0 and the inverse metric will blow up, right? If I take the in inverse metric, I'll have 1 over r square in the metric. So r equals 0 is a terrible point. Now, r equals 0 is a very nice point for the Minkowski metric. It's just that the coordinates are stupid. Right? Spolar, spherical coordinates are completely. Uh, let me find a polite word. Uh, word uh, are uh, completely ill-behaved uh, at the origin. Okay, so the problem with this metric at the origin is uh, that there isn't one. The problem is the coordinates here, right? If I go to Cartesian coordinates, the problem disappears. In other words, sometimes when I look at a tensor field, which looks stupid, this tensor field might be very well behaved, but it's, it looks stupid because I'm using stupid coordinates to describe it. So if I look at this uh, Schwarzschild coordinate uh, metric now, I can think, well, maybe uh, there's something stupid with the coordinate at r equals zero. I know already that, that, that Spherical coordinates at r equals 0 are not well behaved, even in Minkowski. So uh, why should I worry about this uh, singularity? Well, if you calculated the Riemann tensor in Minkowski, you would get 0, right? And especially uh, no matter what coordinate system you are. Uh, if you calculate just the Riemann tensor for, Schwarzschild, for the Schwarzschild metric, you are obviously going to see... Uh, 
Well, there are derivatives of the metric in the Christoffels, which will produce 1 over r squared terms. There are derivatives of the Christoffels, which are going to produce 1 over r cubed terms. So in this coordinate system, you certainly see a problem in, uh, when calculating the Riemann tensor. But maybe again, you can say, well, uh, that's a stupid coordinate system, and the Riemann tensor looks stupid, but it's actually well behaved. Now, this formula is telling you that no matter how hard you try, you will not find coordinates in which the metric is well behaved or in which the Riemann tensor is well behaved, right? Because this object is a scalar. It does not depend upon the coordinates you're using. So no matter what coordinates you calculate it in, it's going to be this, maybe written in other coordinates, but no matter how hard you try, if you take this expression, write it in any coordinates you want and go with r to zero, it's going to go to infinity. So this limit, r going to zero, will always be ill-behaved in the geometry and not because of a problem with the coordinates. So this is the point of calculating scalars, not just calculating the Riemann tensor and saying, well, this Riemann tensor blows up, so this metric is not well-behaved. No, that's not a good enough argument. You need to, if you have a, it might well be true that this is the case, but the, your argument, you just need to say something more. And here, well, you just calculate a scalar, and in particular, this scalar works very well and tells you that this metric is singular at r equals zero. Good. So uh, no matter what happens, uh, 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 with this metric, well, uh, as, well, as soon as m is non-zero, positive or negative, you get a, a singularity at r equals zero. You cannot avoid it. <coughs> now, if you remember also uh, our uh, Jacobi equation or geodesic deviation equation, Entschuldigung, <coughs> geodesic deviation, uh, we had this nice formula. If gamma is a geodesic and z is a, a geodesic deviation field, then it satisfies this uh, uh, equation d2 z alpha over ds square is equal the Riemann times. And now I, I, I've learned my, my signs since last time, so the correct signs are these, I hope. Right, so the Jacobi field appears at the last slot. So this curvature scalar blows up as r goes to infinity. Therefore, no matter what coordinate system you use, this thing is going to blow up as you're approaching infinity. So this is going to go to zero, uh, to infinity as r it goes to zero, at least some components are off, maybe not every component, right? But because this sum of components goes to infinity, then some components will go to infinity. And this means that uh, the right-hand side of this thing will, will have a singular term here. And a result of which, when you're approaching this singularity in, in Schwarzschild, uh, you'll get infinite tidal forces. Right? So remember that these were the forces which uh, uh, act if you have two neighboring geodesics, they're going to be accelerated relative to each other, uh, and where z being this acceleration, this relative well, displacement, and therefore second derivative, the relative acceleration. So you'll get an ex a relative acceleration which goes to infinity in some directions. So when you're falling into uh, the Schwarzschild black hole, into the center, uh, then you will find that some directions get infinitely stretched. You get forces which stretch you infinitely in some directions and compress you into some other ones. And uh, uh, that's not a pretty, uh, pretty sight uh, to see someone falling into the center. You'll get infinite forces, and these forces are strong enough so that you'll be torn apart, uh, so you don't want to go there. So this is uh, the Schwarzschild singularity. Uh, now, what is much more interesting is uh, 
uh, r equal to m and uh, uh, before we discuss the surface uh, let's talk about an important notion which is uh, stationary observers So and uh, the stationary observers will uh, help us also to understand uh, what is this parameter m here? Uh, obviously, this is going to be the mass of the black hole. Uh, but uh, how to understand this? In which sense is this the mass? Then we're going to uh, see that from this definition of stationary observers. And uh, so definition, so these are uh, so stationary observers, so let me just call this SO, uh, are uh, uh, the world lines. Uh, T goes to, uh, well, T R theta phi, where this is constant. This is, it seems to be very good. Let's try another one. Remains. Right. So, so what I mean by that? So, what is a world line? Right. A world line is a time-like curve. Time-like curve. And the axiom is of general activity that uh, physical objects, massive physical objects, move on time-like curves. Time-like future directed. Future directed will have to come back uh, to that very shortly, but for the moment, let's just leave it like that. Uh, so, so, in other words, these are observers, so people sitting in the uh, Schwarzschild geometry uh, that don't move at all in space, but of course time uh, flows along. So, uh, well, uh, what is the, uh, so in other words we have these curves uh, x mu of t uh, uh, which are here, x mu of t. So the tangent is tangent uh, dx mu over dt, which is just uh, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, which is just the vector d over dt. Now, uh, what is the proper time? Well, if you have a curve in special relativity, the proper time uh, over uh, S, uh, proper time along a curve, um, along uh, a curve, right? So x mu of S is defined by S is equal, well, ds is square root of minus g 
uh, dx over ds dx over ds times, uh, ah, okay, I should use a different parameter here, lambda, so this is, I have a curve, so you have a curve lambda goes to x mu of lambda, so I take the derivative with respect to the parameter, Uh, right, so this is the increase of proper time, uh, and this was supposed to be in, in a special relativity, so I put the metric, the Minkowski metric here, so this is what we learned about proper time in special relativity in the last term. Well, obviously, in a local inertial coordinate, I can replace the metric eta by my spacetime metric g, and then I get the formula in general relativity, right? So, uh, what you need to do is just replace uh, eta by g, right? According to this principle, how to do physics in um, curved space-time, if you know how to do it in special relativity. So, Uh, so this formula is the same as, after you've done this replacement, is the same as saying that ds over d lambda is uh, square root of this minus g dx over d lambda dx over d lambda. And note that the sign is important because it's supposed to be a time-like curve. So the tangent to this curve should have... Uh, negative length, uh, and which is of course the same as saying that s uh, between two, uh, the amount of time between two events is this integral of uh, So this is the physical time observed, experienced by an observer. And of course, this is uh, not something that you can prove. This is something which already in uh, Minkowski space-time, right, that, that this definition of proper time along the curve is just an uh, axiom. That's how we experience time in special relativity. And then this definition with eta replaced by g is just this correspondence principle. And uh, whether this is the biological time that we experience or not is a different story. Right? Whether uh, I think, to the best of my knowledge, this corresponds very much to a, a biological time a cesium atom experiences. So, in other words, a cesium atom has its biological time counted by transitions, and uh, this uh, all uh, our experiments involving general relativity involve this interpretation of the physical time for an atom and uh, and this works. I don't know any experiment which would contradict this. Now as far as our own biological time is concerned I think uh, it's probably a hard cookie here uh, because I personally don't feel that the time on my clock is actually linearly translates to my own time. Uh, well, there's a question of aging. Of course, I, was, I had a perception of time which was completely different when I was younger than when I am now. That's one story. But even then, you know, when you're sitting there and you're bored, it sounds like time just never advances, right? You're sitting uh, on the 
chair in your dentist <laughs> and this takes forever each second takes forever right and and uh, when you're doing something interesting actually time flies so so i think that uh, it, it must be the case that there is a psych psychological individual notion of time which doesn't translate in any obvious way to something like that but of course uh, uh, it does translate to the time on our iPhones or clocks or cesium clocks or mechanical clocks. Uh, so that's uh, how we understand time in along time-like curves in general relativity. So now, uh, so for a stationary observer, uh, how would this work? Well, there is a tangent, there is a unit tangent, which is uh, 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 normalized so that uh, well this is u is dx mu over ds right dx mu over ds which will be uh, uh, dx mu over d lambda d lambda over ds so when you have a curve parameterized by lambda as we have here uh, then if you want to calculate the unit tangent you just need this formula for d lambda over ds uh, which you get from here. Right? So, well, you have d lambda over ds, over ds over d lambda, and so the unit tangent is defined by the condition that g of u u is minus one. Uh, so maybe let's check. Uh, so g of d lambda over Yes, dx mu over d lambda twice. Well, uh, right, so this is my u here, d lambda over ds dx, and I don't need an index, I write it like that, dx over d lambda, then because the metric is bilinear, then this is d lambda over ds square uh, g of dx over d lambda, and if you can compare with equation, so this was equation one, so this is my equation two, uh, this is minus one. So this is the unit tangent. Uh, so if we use this formula for our stationary observers, the tangent is uh, Maybe I should have written a partial derivative, right? So this is the vector d over dt. Uh, then uh, let me call this equation a star, and let me erase it right away because I need the room. Or maybe I just first erase here. Then, uh, uh, so, well, lambda in this case is t, uh, and uh, dx over dt is just the vector dt. So, uh, if we use this formula, e, the normalized unit tangent to, uh, to these observers is, uh, what did I say, d lambda over ds. So I need to divide one over square root of minus g dt dt dt. So this is uh, one over square root minus dtt times dt. Gtt I can read it from one.
right? Because I have minus V here, so minus minus becomes plus. And I have uh, immediately a problem that V should be positive. Is it? Well, not necessarily, right? If, because if I uh, take my equation for V, so uh, V is positive, means that uh, 1 is larger than 2m over r, which means that Uh, that r is larger than 2m. Mm -hmm. So this is the same as la r larger than 2m. And the bottom line here is that there are stationary observers outside the event horizon. So r equal to m is going to be the event horizon. So let me use this name already. Or in the region r larger than 2m. But there are no stationary observers under the horizon. So, so no, no stationary observers under the horizon. Good. But so... Uh, we can't read it. Good, but for uh, large distances, uh, we have the stationary observers. So these are those guys who are sitting there and are doing nothing. Uh, boring life. The geometry doesn't change. Nothing interesting to see because uh, Everything is stationary. But they experience something, namely an acceleration. And how do we define a geometric acceleration? Well, uh, in SR, the acceleration was defined as uh, d u mu over ds. This was the acceleration vector. Now, in uh, local inertial coordinates, this is the same as the covariant derivative over S uh, in local inertial coordinates. But now this is a geometrically well-defined notion. So in GR, you just define a mu as the derivative of the uh, of the four velocity. So this is the four velocity, uh, normalized vector, and this is proper time, right? Here is S is the proper time. So uh, let's calculate this uh, acceleration for the stationary observers. Good. So we already know what u is, right? So let me just copy it here u is equal 1 over square root of uh, 1 minus 2m over r dt. And we want to calculate this. So there is a calculation that we already did uh, two days ago. which relates the flow of a vector field uh, 
and its acceleration and things like that. So, and the uh, derivatives along this flow. Uh, so, I'm not going to repeat it here. But leave it as an exercise, and the calculation is the same as the one we did last time. See last lecture, see the calculation in the last lecture. <laughs> and this is again a, a French exercise uh, in the in last lecture. Uh, so that this a mu, I can just calculate. Well, a covariant derivative along a tangent to a curve, well, I can calculate it as a first calculate uh, the covariant derivative of this vector field when I have one in the direction of tangent to these curves, but the tangent is just u itself. And so this is how we can calculate this acceleration. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to repeat this calculation, but it's exactly the same calculation as we did last time. And what we did is actually to show that this is zero. Uh, uh, so uh, um, geodesic would correspond to uh, this acceleration being zero. That's uh, right. So if you uh, a geodesic satisfies the equation d mu over d s equals zero. So in particular. Stationary observers are not geodesics, right? Geodesics are free fall. And stationary observers is, uh, well, you could think that in, at a very rough approximation, right now that I'm a stationary observer in the field of, uh, in the gravitational field of the Earth. So I'm just sitting at fixed radius at fixed uh, spherical coordinates on the surface of the Earth, right? So I'm not geodesic. I'm not in free fall because being in free fall would mean that I would just fall uh, straight towards the uh, center of the Earth. Uh, there is a force which keeps me on the surface, and therefore I'm not freely falling. Right? Then the gravity force uh, of my several kilos uh, is counteracted by the reaction of, uh, of the flow. So I'm not a freely falling object. I do experience forces. Stationary observers are not freely falling. Good. So let's calculate uh, this. Uh, this is our vector u. So uh, u has only a t component. So this will be, uh, and let me just uh, calculate this. Uh, with uh, uh, all components immediately. So let me just put a basis here. So here I will only have a zero component. And now if you were uh, a little too fast, you would think, well, you has only a zero component, therefore this vector field or this has only a zero component, but not because you need to take uh, into account the Christoffels, right? So uh, par covariant derivative is d zero u mu plus gamma mu alpha beta u alpha u beta d mu. Uh, well, d0 u mu is easy because u only depends upon r. So this is uh, 0. And this sum is easy also because u has only components uh, in the 0. So this is gamma uh, mu 0, 0, u0 zero square d mu. Well, u0 square, I have it here, so I can just uh, put it in without problems. In fact, let me just do it right away. It's uh, 1 over 
1 minus 2m over r. That's the u0 square thing, right? So u0 is the zero component of u, so I have to square this. And uh, gamma mu0, 0, 0 is 1 half gamma g mu nu. Oh gosh, so I have d0 g nu 0 plus another one where I change the order, but uh, that's uh, the same. But let me write it again, and there is one half d nu g zero zero. Now I see that da Daniel looks at uh, the blackboard very perplexed. Did I write something wrong, Daniel? No, it's okay. Uh, well, that's the formula for the Christoffels, right? So, u0... I see. Uh, I, should I write a little bigger? Or, I mean, oh, these markers are, are unfortunately not very good. So, is, is there a place which I should correct? Please shout. And let me know, right? If I go too fast, too slow, or you can't read it, or it doesn't make sense. Yeah, so I mean, don't tell me none of what you're saying does make sense because that might well be true, but uh, that would be crushing. So once again, right? Let's go through this slowly. The acceleration vector, that's the definition, right? So I just write it in components. Now, uh, the exercise was to show that uh, uh, this formula, so covariant derivative along a curve of a vector, when you have a vector field, you can just write it using the covariant derivatives in space-time, and this d over ds, direction tangent to the curve, so, so that uh, explains this contraction. Good. So now my u only has a time component. So out of this, oh, and of course, uh, but there should be a u naught here. So it's good, right? So this is u naught here, and there's a u naught here as well. Uh, so now I write, so u naught stays here. Let me just... Write it here as well. Uh, and there's an, another u naught then. So, so this is the covariant derivative of u mu, and the covariant derivative is a partial one plus Christoffel's. Uh, this is an alpha, and this is a beta. Uh, then the time derivative of mu, mu is zero because u is time independent, so this term drops out. So we have the u naught here, and only the Christoffel stay, and each uh, u has only a zero component, so I have the u zero square, gamma mu, d mu. Then uh, there's a d mu missing here. Then this u naught is here, this u naught square I've already written like, like that. Uh, and then I have, uh, so this is zero, the time derivative of the metric is zero, this is zero, only this one stays, and g0, zero, zero is here, g0, zero, zero depends only upon uh, r, right, so, uh, so there's only the r index which survives. So I get, well, u0 over 1 minus 2m over r, and I have g uh, r uh, g mu r dr and with a minus sign here dr 
d0, 0. Yes? At which place? Here? Here? Yes. Thank you. Of course. Good. Me bad. I, this should be okay. This should be a zero here, right? Yeah, I, I was wondering, the, the powers didn't feel right. I, I, I just uh, remembered this square, so that power didn't feel right. Right, so there's a zero here, thanks a lot, right? Okay, good. And therefore, uh, this square is too much, right? Yeah, and therefore, this was okay. I shouldn't have corrected it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so this is uh, our, f and there is a vector d mu missing here. Uh, maybe, let me copy this before I erase. And then I can erase this. Good. So, uh, well, dr g0, 0, 0, this shouldn't be too difficult to calculate. Now, uh -huh. what is the inverse metric, right? Because we have the metric here. So, g is uh, minus v, v to minus 1 uh, r square, r square sine square theta, and a lot of zeros. Metric is diagonal. So the inverse metric is minus 1 over v, v, and uh, that's the only thing I need actually here for my purposes, and who cares, because I need g mu r, right? I need g mu r, so, well, actually I also need the zeros here. zero, big zero, and something here. Who cares? Uh, then this means that g mu r is, uh, has only an r component. So let me just continue. This calculation is uh, minus minus 1 over 1 minus 2m over r, uh, 1 half the uh, inverse metric, so there will be g r r only here, and d r g 0 0. g r r is v, but this is also v. Well, this is v. So I get, so they cancel out, minus one half, the derivative of g0, 0, 0, which is again v, 1 minus 2m over r. Uh, aha, g0, 0 is actually minus v, right? So uh, this is minus v. So therefore, I get a plus here. Uh, 
the derivative of one is zero and the derivative of this that is a uh, 2m over r square uh, two cancels out and uh, there's a dr vector here missing all the time so the bottom line is the acceleration is a radial vector equal to m over r square dr well if you happen to read about theory of good lecturing well this is certainly not good lecturing because i'm making mistakes all the time but uh, part of the theory is a colombo rule that uh, the murder rare should be known at the beginning of the episode right so uh, i managed to tell you that the murder is this formula so we want a formula for the acceleration here it is uh, and it looks uh, very much like a Newtonian acceleration uh, for a central object, right? Acceleration with mass m. So actually yes and no uh, it does look like newtonian acceleration in fact it looks too good to be true because this is exactly the newtonian acceleration now uh, the question is uh, is it uh, does it have the right sign so uh, this is a vector, so if the mass is positive, then this vector is pointing outwards, right? If I have a body here, then this vector is pointing outwards. Now the Newtonian acceleration should be going downwards. So is this consistent with uh, Newtonian physics? Maybe I, uh, I have my, uh, well, uh, first hypothesis, I made a mistake in my calculations. But maybe I did on the go, at the, but this formula is correct as is, right? So there were several signs which one had to keep track of, and I think that this formula is correct. So this formula is telling you that this acceleration is pointing outwards. So it's saying, well, if this is, uh, should be reproduced uh, Newtonian theory, maybe it should be pointing inwards. So maybe my sign here is wrong. Maybe I should have written plus 2m, where m is the mass of the body. So, is the sign correct or not? And of course it is, because uh, this is the right way of writing the Schwarzschild metric. So, can someone help me here? So, I'm going to erase this while you're thinking about it. Of course, maybe you're all, uh, by the way, I, I said the Colombo rule, but maybe you're all too, too young to even know who Colombo was. Anyone knows who Colombo was? I'm not talking about Christopher Colombo, the discoverer of America. But... Say it again. Yeah, there was a criminal series uh, way uh, before you were born. Uh, what was the name of the main, the actor playing Colombo? Falk, right? Yeah, Falk. He had this uh, always wearing a, a, a coat and uh, um, yeah, he, he actually. Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, it happened that a few days ago, I uh, happened to see uh, him on the screen and he was always uh, either wearing a 2P or having different uh, 
colors of her from episode to another. So. <laughs> And he had actually this kind of perplexed look on his face. And if you look uh, you know, attentively, you'll see that he has a, a one eye is a, is a glass eye. And that makes his look. Uh, so he, has, uh, he had one eye only. And uh, so, so he had this weird way of looking at um, his colleagues. Well, what about the sign anyway? So can someone help me here? So I'm, sit I'm st sitting here on the surface of the Earth. What is my acceleration? Well, my acceleration is zero because I'm not moving. The force which is acting on me is downwards. And therefore, compared to free fall, I'm accelerating outwards. Right? So the force that I need to used to counteract gravity is this one. So the force that is needed to counteract the Newton acceleration is actually pointing upwards. And that's why these guys are not moving. Right? They, have a, they experience a gravitational force. To prevent to be falling, they have to counteract with an acceleration, which is this one. So this is the explanation of the sign. But again, uh, here, this, is, this isn't quite right because this is a coordinate expression. If we look at the invariant length of the acceleration, well, you have a vector. Uh, in coordinates, it can be whatever it is. Uh, what your geometric object would be its length, so GAA is uh, g of m over r square and its length I need a square root. Uh, well, we, it, it will turn out that the sign is okay. If not, I will change it as we go, but uh, it is, uh, well, it's going to be whatever it is. So it's the square root of uh, m over r square square because the metric is bilinear, so I can just pull each factor in front once. And then I left with grr. Now grr is 1 over v. It's a 1 over v. So this is, uh, if m is positive, or let me just take the absolute value, or, well, let's assume m is positive, just not to bother. So m is positive, and this is, and r is positive, of course, uh, m over uh, r square and 1 over square root 1 minus 2m over r. Okay? So the length is not quite uh, the same as the Newtonian expression. But it's almost, right? But behaves like m over r square for large r. And so uh, m is the Newtonian mass or uh, at large distance. M is uh, felt like a Newtonian mass. Of what? Well, of this metric, right? Of this metric. His experience, I should say, perhaps would be a nicer way of saying that. Good. So this is uh, Newtonian obs uh, stationary observers, stationary observers in the Schwarzschild field. Just sit in the geometry. Nothing happens around. They're not falling. 
So because they're not falling, they have to counteract the gravitational force with uh, an acceleration. And this acceleration at large distances is the same as they would have to use if they were in a Newtonian field of an object which has a mass m. Good. So let's see how are we doing with time. Uh, still 15 minutes, right? Okay, good. So we can just uh, start uh, our analysis of um, of the surface r equal to m, but or almost start an analysis of the surface uh, because uh, before we do this, we're going to do some causality theory. So uh, I shouldn't have erased the inverse metric, but that's that's okay. We haven't erased it yet, but it's going to flow down the blackboard if I don't erase it, uh, or the light board, in fact. Yeah, the technical name of this contraption is light board. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. And somehow it has a more serious feeling than sitting in my dining room <laughs> and writing on a tablet. So I try to become in curious as much as I can. I must have pressed it while erasing. Thanks for pointing this out. And the sound disappeared as well, or probably, right? No? You could hear me? Uh -huh, I see. Okay. Well, it's good to know. There's no privacy here, even if I switch off the camera. <laughs> yeah, good. So, um, yes, yeah, so before we uh, understand this event horizon, we have to do a some elementary causality theory. So understand what causality is in space times. And so this is our next section. Uh, so paragraph uh, 3. Point, uh, Eva, help, please. 3.3? Three, three? Um, it's 4. OK, good. Yeah. No, no, it's yes. 4.3. Okay, great. Okay. So this is a new way of writing 4 in Greek. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to remove this because this goes on YouTube and so I'm going to look like an idiot, right? I already look like an idiot en enough without the people think that I don't know how to write 4. Good. Uh, so this is elements of causality, some, some causality. Uh, so uh, the first point is uh, uh, time orientation. So if you want to think about causality, uh, well, your causality is the same as, uh, 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 as the, the Minkowskian one in local inertial coordinates. So you go to a point P in a Lorentzian manifold and uh, take a local inertial coordinate. Then G is the same as uh, the Minkowski metric at this point. So in other words, G is minus dt square plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. And now if you look at the null vectors, so gxx equals 0.
So time goes this way. Right, so time, and this is space. So the null vectors are here, right? So, uh, uh, so, so this is uh, x null is equal length of the space part of x, and plus minus, right? So at each point of your manifold, you have a light cone of null vectors. Uh, you also have the cone, a solid cone of time-like vectors. And here as well, etc. Right? So you have the known ones, the time like one, the causal one, both. But you have two sets of them. There's one set which points in one direction, one set points in the other direction. And the right thing is actually to remove the center here because it's neither, right? So zero is not, not a causal vector. So these are really two different sets. And so you have this Lorentzian manifold, and every point you have. Uh, two sets of uh, distinct sets of, say, timeline vectors, and you have to decide which ones are future pointing and which ones are past pointing, right? So at every point, uh, at every point, decide, uh, decide which, which are future, which are past. And uh, well, this is uh, this is your choice because uh, I could make a coordinate transformation. Uh, t goes to minus t. The metric remains unchanged, and then one set of vectors go into into another. So if I chosen some coordinates and I'm saying, well, actually I like these ones to be future pointing, then somebody changes coordinates, says t to minus t, and says, well, actually, but for me they're these ones, and that's perfectly okay as long as we know what we're talking about. And so a change, or a choice of time orientation is to say at which point, at each point, which vectors are future and uh, uh, which are past. Time orientation is the choice Uh, I wish we had some markers which work better. Time orientation at each point. This is a choice at each point. Which vectors are future directed? Which causal vectors are future directed? Well, of course, if you say which are causal, then you know which one are past. So that's which causal vectors are future directed. Now, that's almost good enough, but you want to do it in a continuous way. And the best way for me to show you why there might be a difference, let me undress. So now I'll be undressing, making a striptease on YouTube. And of course, a black belt is not a very <laughs> useful object to manipulate when you are uh, behind a, well, on a, um, on a black background. But I hopefully you'll be going to be able to see this. So let me show you an example of two-dimensional space-time where you cannot choose a time orientation in a continuous way, and that's the Mobius uh, band. So what's a Mobius band? Well, you take a, your favorite band, and rather than to close it the way you're supposed to do it normally, you close it with a twist. Okay? So I just take this band here and close it with a twist. Okay? So now I have a Mobius strip. And now suppose that my light cones are pointing. And so this is a very nice Lorentzian manifold with a flat metric. At each point, 
I just write this metric here, minus dt squared plus dx squared. Times goes up. Space goes along my belt. So I lay it flat. I use the flat coordinates, and I have a metric on it. Right? And now I say, well, time flows in this direction okay, at this point. So now I take my Mobius band. I lock it with the wrong way around. And remember, time was flowing in this direction at this point. So now I go around following the same phase. And when I come back, <laughs> time flows in the wrong direction now. Okay? In this example, if you take the Möbius band with a flat metric, with time flowing this direction, and you make this identification, you cannot choose a time orientation in a continuous way. You can at every point say, I'm going to choose an orientation like that. But when I go around the loop, it's not going to work anymore. And no matter how you try, it will not work. Uh, be aware that this is not a topological problem related to the topology of the Mobius band. Because if I choose still the same Mobius band, but I say, well, this is still a two-dimensional flat uh, space-time with this metric minus dt squared plus dx squared, but time flows now in this direction, then if I do my Mobius band identification and I go around, nothing, nothing bad will happen. Right? So if I'm pointing along the direction of the band with my time, when I come back, I'd still be pointing in the right direction. So this is not a, nothing to do with the topology of the object. This has to do with the Lorentzian metric and the topology, right? both of them. In any case, on this uh, Mobius band, uh, there is a problem with time orientation. And a space-time is a Lorentzian manifold on which you can find a time orientation. Okay? And we say it's time-oriented then. So this is a starting point of any causality uh, analysis. So let me just close my Möbius band before I end up being in underwear. Not that you see it here, but still, <laughs> it's embarrassing. It would be embarrassing. Uh, so, so good. So definition, the space-time mg is a space-time if G is a Lorentzian metric which is time orientable, right? For which uh, time orientation exists. And of course, if there is one, there are two. Because if you've chosen at every point my future is this one, then somebody else can say, no, no, you're an idiot. Uh, the future is the other one, and it's, okay, that's another, right? For, so you, you have to choose one. Exists and has been prescribed, right? So uh, exists and has been prescribed. And has been prescribed. So not only it exists, but you have decided already which one you choose. Which one. So this is space-time. And uh, so in Minkowski space-time, if you are in Minkowski, then there's these two obvious uh, choices. And you say, well, I have my t-coordinate, uh, and future means t-increasing. Right? A vector is future if the t-coordinate in this vector is positive. That's the standard uh, time orientation in Minkowski space-time. That's the one which we're always going to use. Now, in Schwarzschild, uh, Schwarzschild is not Minkowski, but uh, the metric uh, approaches the Minkowski metric at large distances. Now, if we just take, uh, 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 as r goes to infinity, the metric
if R goes to infinity, the metric behaves pretty much like a metric with uh, um, uh, zero mass, right? So this uh, M over R time goes to zero, which is Minkowski space-time. And so there is always a natural uh, time orientation in uh, Schwarzschild uh, with M equals, with, uh, in for a large R, Schwarzschild, a uh, large R. Yeah, there is a, we choose, we always choose the time orientation so that uh, future pointing vectors vectors have x0 positive. And this is a good place to stop the lecture here. So um, this notion now we know what the, the Schwarzschild, uh, the, at least the r larger than 2m uh, part of Schwarzschild has a time orientation which we choose like that. And note that this doesn't tell us anything about what happens for r smaller than 2m because this is for r larger than 2m. And for the moment, r smaller than 2m is completely disjoint from r larger than 2m. We cannot cross r equal to m. So we'll see how to cross it uh, next week. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. No questions? So my mistake counter wasn't too bad today. I think I probably made, uh, well, there was one stupid mistake with the uh, u0 in the acceleration, but I think other than that, I, was, I did pretty much better than last time. So try to keep it. See you next week. Bye-bye.